Well, let's turn to Acts 17 then. Uh, and as I say, we're going to be thinking particularly tonight about verses 15, sorry, 16 uh, and 17. And I want us to uh, answer a very important question from these verses, and it's this. What is it that should motivate us as God's people to proclaim the gospel? Particularly to a hostile culture. We sang in our first song, didn't we? A very good uh, song to sing. I didn't choose it, but uh, an excellent one, very much on topic. Uh, and talking about um, reaching out to the lost, um, filled with passion, proclaiming salvation in Jesus' name. What should really get us up and moving to do that? What should provide the impetus? What should be the dynamic? What should really energize us to proclaim the gospel particularly when we're conscious we are proclaiming the gospel to a culture which to a large degree does not want it and in fact hates those who proclaim it would like to eradicate those who proclaim it and may even be prepared to make those who proclaim it suffer what should still make us want to do this when we know it is going to cost a church that is serious about proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and rose for our justification, a church that is really committed to that will pay a price for its commitment and its endeavours. It'll be blessed and it'll receive an eternal reward, but on this life it will suffer. For that we see that in act 17 don't we at the way in which the jews uh, in thessalonica were really stirred up with anger and hatred for paul and silas as they proclaimed this message and they chased paul and silas basically out of thessalonica um, the possibility is if they'd actually got hold of them they may well have killed them but thankfully by God's providential appointing they didn't get hold of them but Paul and Silas clearly realized it's a bit hot for us here uh, and for the to, to, to safeguard future ministry we need to get out of here and they go to Berea and they get a better reception there but the Jews in Thessalonica hear that these people are up to what they were doing in Thessalonica in Berea and they pursue them there and again Paul has to flee Listen to how Paul described uh, his experience of gospel ministry. This was the reception that he was given. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Then he says, three times I was shipwrecked. Now, that wasn't due to opposition, but again, it was part of the cost of traveling to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Well, how could we not tonight want to sign up for that? It sounds so thrilling uh, and exciting, doesn't it? Welcome to the work of proclaiming Jesus Christ. Paul was realistic and honest about what it had meant for him. And yet he kept on proclaiming. What was it that stirred him to do this, even though he knew what it would cost and had experienced what it would cost, yet up he gets and goes again, and up he gets and goes again. And what I want to show you from these verses in Acts 17 is that what kept Paul 
going. What meant that Paul couldn't just say, look, this is too much. This is too hard. This is too costly. No, knowing the cost, Paul doesn't deny that. Paul doesn't say, oh, no, it's all right, actually. He says, this costs. This leads to great suffering and pain and heartache, but I can't not do it. And the reason he could not do it is, as we see here, he was consumed by an overwhelming passion to see God glorified in people's lives. That was Paul's vision for his work. He was determined by God's grace that he would use the gifts he'd been given to proclaim the message he had been given so that people would come to know and worship and honour and adore and praise and serve his God. That was Paul's ambition. That's what drove him. He wanted people to see the glory and the majesty and the splendor of God and to acknowledge it and to adore him. And I suppose there's a question to ask at the very outset tonight is this. What motivates us to tell out the good news of Jesus Christ. We know we've received that command. We don't need to go through the scriptures tonight to prove that. We know we've received this command. This is your mission, uh, your call to Clidach and perhaps some surrounding villages or whatever to tell out this good news and we've sang about it and to sing salvation song and so on. But when you know what it'll cost, when you know how hard it'll be, what gets you going? What is it you're seeking to achieve? What's the end of all this for you? Is it that you want to see God glorified in this village? Is Kedach a village or a town? I don't forgive me. But you want to see God glorified in this area. You want people to see who God is. To be absolutely taken aback and blown away by that. And to just declare, my God, how great you are. Well, that's um, where I want us to go tonight, as it were. So let's begin to, to drill into these verses now uh, and see how that comes out. And looking at verse 16. Paul is on his second missionary journey. Uh, it's been an eventful journey. Uh, he's already visited, amongst other places, Philippi, uh, Thessalonica, and Berea. And he now finds himself in Athens, uh, we may not be familiar much with Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, but surely we've heard of Athens, and perhaps some people here tonight may have been there. Uh, now, it's possible that a few days in this once magnificent city was not something Paul had planned on, uh, because verses 12 to 15 of this chapter indicate that he has been taken there for his own safety. He'd encountered, as I've just said, significant opposition from the Jews in Thessalonica, and then they had pursued him as far as Berea. Uh, and he has to leave, and he's escorted by um, the, the believers in Berea to Athens uh, as a, some kind of a, a safe haven for him. That was about 200 miles away from Berea, so he really has to go a long way to get away from these people. Now, Paul's missionary partners, Silas and Timothy, they've deliberately stayed behind in Berea to continue ministry uh, to this um, group that has come to faith. But Paul sends the people who've taken him to Athens back to Berea with a message. I want Silas and Timothy at the earliest opportunity to meet me here in Athens because there's work for us to do here. And so as verse 16 begins, Paul is now in Athens on his own, waiting for them to join him. What's he going to do? Well, he decides, it seems, to take a stroll around the city. He walks around Athens. We read that in verse 23, don't we? As I passed along. That can be translated, passed through or walked around. Paul goes out to get a feel for the place. What's it like here? Where are the people at? That's interesting, isn't it? He wants to contextualise himself to begin with. I've got a message, but I want to bring this to this city. But what city is this? How am I going to bring this to these people? Uh, and as Paul 
uh, walks around, he would have seen, no doubt, uh, many things. He would have seen breathtaking architecture. Because at that time, Athens had some of the finest buildings in the world. And many people came from all over to see the sights in Athens and to see the, uh, the, the glory, if you like, of uh, man's creation. Many wanted to go there because they knew that this was the city that had been home to some of the most renowned philosophers in the ancient world. And the philosophers were the superstars of their day. They were the film stars and the rugby players of their day. And so it was a bustling city and many people would have been walking around. Paul would have seen uh, a lot of breathtaking architecture, a lot of people and so on. But what are we told that Paul saw? I'm just telling you what we can surmise he would have seen. But what are we definitely told here in this passage that Paul saw? Verse 16, that the city was full of idols. He saw ultimately not a city full of artistic beauty and architectural splendor, but a city full of idols. And Luke, when he wrote that, was not exaggerating. Athens was utterly swamped by statues, shrines, and temples dedicated to all kinds of false gods. It was oppressive. You couldn't move for these edifices of paganism. Images abounded of Apollo, Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, Bacchus, Neptune, Diana, Hermes, little quiz for you when you go home, find out which of what they were the gods. Uh, but all these gods uh, in Athens, it was said there were so many statues and sculptures of false gods in the city that when you went out for a walk, you would meet a god before you met a man. Uh, and there was probably um, some element of hyperbole in that, but also at least a grain of truth. And this is what Paul saw with eyes opened by the Holy Spirit, not culture, not learning, but idolatry on an almost unprecedented scale. Paul saw the glory that belongs to God alone, the God who made the world and everything in it, Lord of heaven and earth, the glory that was rightly his, the worship, the praise, the adoration that belonged to him, being withheld from him, and given to others. That's what he saw. Now, secondly, then, how did Paul feel about that? What did Paul see? A city full of idols. God's glory being given to others. Secondly, how did Paul feel as a result of that? Well, again, Luke tells us we don't have to speculate. While Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. His spirit was provoked within him. The Greek word translated there, provoked, uh, can also be translated greatly distressed. Not a bit cheesed off or a bit miffed. He was greatly distressed, meant when it was first coined in Greek to have a fit or a seizure. And by the time Luke was writing, it was used as an idiom in Greek to speak of a very powerful emotional reaction. So you heard something or you saw something that really upset you deep within. Uh, and it's, this term was used for it. And in a sense, that's carried over into English, isn't it? Because we might say of somebody, when he heard what she said, he had a fit. And we don't mean literally at an epileptic fit, but we mean it really upset him. It really disturbed him. It got him quite hot under the collar. And what Luke is saying is that when Paul saw all these statues and shrines and temples and images, all this adoration and worship and praise being given to others and everyone but the true and living God, he was furious. He was outraged. He wasn't just slightly annoyed or mildly irritated, disappointed that it should be like this. He was very angry. Was he right to be angry? Yes. 
there is such a thing as righteous anger. It is possible to be angry and not to sin. There's a holy, pure anger. We know that because Jesus Christ himself was angry on occasions during his earthly ministry. Angry with the Pharisees for the way in which they were deceiving and oppressing God's people. Angry with the many changers who had set up business on the uh, part of the temple grounds where the Gentiles were supposed to be able to come to meet the living God, the Lord God of Israel. And you remember Jesus expressed his anger in a, an unmistakable way by turning over their tables and throwing them out of the temple. He didn't just say, you know, could you leave, please? I'm not particularly pleased with what you're doing. The Lord was angry and expressed that anger in a very physical way. And yet we know from uh, the scriptures quite clear, the Lord Jesus Christ was without sin. So we have an angry Jesus and yet a sinless Jesus, which teaches us then that it is possible to be angry and not sin. And indeed, Paul gives that command, doesn't he, in Ephesians, to be angry and not sin. And the issue about whether it's right to be angry, and I say Paul is angry, is about what is it that stirs up this anger in him? And it's, well, what fills Paul with such rage? It is the fact that God is being, so we might say, robbed of his glory. Paul is jealous for the glory of God. And Paul will not accept anything less than that God be glorified, than that God be worshipped, praised, and adored by men, women, and children. And two things really anger Paul. Firstly, clearly, that they're not worshipping God. That's bad enough. Secondly, that instead of worshipping God, they're worshipping idols, taking what is his and ascribing it to another, saying that it's this God who has created us. It's this God who has uh, made sure we need everything, we, we, we have everything we need for food and so on. It's this God who has given us children and so on. And for Paul to see these things being ascribed to others rather than God was like a dagger through his heart. We see there, don't we, how much Paul loved God. And how much Paul's heart belonged to God in that he couldn't bear the thought and the sight of God being dishonoured. He couldn't bear the thought or the sight of God being deprived of what was his by sovereign right. There was an outrage in Paul. This isn't right. This isn't fair. This shouldn't be so. It's God and he alone who is entitled to this service, adoration and worship. He must be worshipped. And to see that not happening hurt Paul. John Calvin says, Paul made it plain, by the way he responded, that nothing was more precious to him than the glory of God of God. It's a challenge, isn't it? He made it plain that nothing was more precious to him than the glory of God. Do you remember Elijah on Mount Carmel? And he was angry too, wasn't he? And he prayed. I won't go through all the details of the story now. But he prayed, didn't he, for something? What was it? That God would send the fire. Why? that they may know that you are God in Israel and not Baal. Because Elijah was grieved and deeply pained in the depths of his being to see Baal being worshipped and not God. And Paul, uh, sorry, Elijah couldn't live with that. He couldn't rest while that was the case. And so he pleads with the Lord on Mount Carmel, Lord, show that you are the God of glory and show that you are the one who is to be served. Nothing was more precious to Paul and to Elijah than the glory of God. And I ask tonight of myself first and foremost, but of all of us, can that be said of us? 
that nothing matters more to us than the glory and the worship of God. And there is nothing we desire more than to see homes and shops and so on in Clidach filled with people who have seen, who recognize, and who declare the glory and the majesty of God. Is that what you want? Is that what you're passionate about? Is that what you're going to invest in? Your energy, your time, uh, your financial resources. Uh, is that what it's all about for you? Because we live, in a sense, in a culture strikingly similar to what Paul saw. Uh, I don't think, forgive me, Carmarthen's the same, I don't think we're overwhelmed with stunning architecture here. And we may not have the great philosophers of the world having come from here. Uh, and certainly people are not flooding into our areas, uh, are they, to see these things. But in terms of the, the vibe and the heartbeat of Clidach and Carmarthen, it's the vibe and heartbeat of Athens. It's worship and adoration because we're created to worship. We're created to reach out to something greater. We're created to serve and cherish and be in awe of something. That's why we love to go to the Grand Canyon or we love to see a world-class rugby team or something perform at their best because we love to be awed and we love to be astounded by things. We're created for that. We're created to be awed and astounded by God. But what happens is we're seeking it everywhere else. And we adore and cherish and serve and are thrilled and astounded by everything else but God. And primarily ourselves. And we live in towns and villages drowning in idolatry. The worship of ourselves, the worship of our families, the worship of our career, the worship of this, that and the other. How does it make you feel when you go out onto the streets and you see God dismissed? Perhaps actively and verbally, people say, oh, a load of rubbish. There is no God. Or, oh, well, what kind of God is he that did this in the Old Testament? And where his name is besmirched. Or we see his laws trampled underfoot. And in that, people are saying... Who is he? Who cares about him? Why should we listen to a word he has to say? Despising. Not just, oh, well, that doesn't work for me, you know. It's despising. It's bringing shame in their hearts and minds anyway upon the name and the character of the God of our salvation. How does that make us feel? Does it grieve us? Does it bother us? Or have we got to a point now where we shrug it off, really, or, well, that's just how it is, or that's a shame. Have our hearts been dulled in this way? John Stott said this, whenever God is denied his rightful place in people's lives, and that is on the throne of them, whenever he is denied his rightful place in people's lives, we should feel inwardly wounded and jealous for his name. Inwardly wounded and jealous for his name. If you were to hear somebody speaking about your husband or wife or your parents or your children or a close friend, somebody in the church that you valued and you heard them being dismissed or things that were not true being said about them, it would hurt, wouldn't it? wouldn't just be, oh, well, that's a shame to hear that. You would be heard and you'd almost want to stand up and say, well, that's not so. I won't have it because it grieves us. Do we feel like that about the God of our salvation? Henry Martin, uh, who was a missionary to Persia, modern-day Iran, uh, in the 19th century, uh, said this when he arrived in Persia and saw the idolatry like Paul in Athens. He said this, I could not endure existence if Jesus was not glorified. It would be hell to me if he were to be always dishonoured. He arrived in Persia and he said, I can't cope with this. To see such idolatry, to see such rejection of the true and living God 
in favour of worthless idols. I wonder are we there? That we are distressed, maybe even brought up at night, woken up at night and kept up at night rather by this. May God give us that consuming passion to see God honoured and glorified, that we be grieved not to see it. A righteous anger to see God not given what was his. Sinful anger, of course, is stirred up basically by an assault upon ourselves. That's sinful anger, isn't it? The wrong anger that we should repent of and seek to put to death. When we see someone doing something that hurts us or affects us and we lash out, something against us, but something against God should rightly make us angry. But then thirdly and finally, it is important, what Paul saw, a city full of idols, how it made Paul feel deeply hurt, cut to the heart, disturbed to the core of his being. Thirdly and finally, what did Paul do? <laughs> what Paul saw, how he felt, now lastly what he did. He did something about what he saw out of how he felt. You see, righteous wrath is a productive emotion. That's the difference between sinful wrath and uh, righteous wrath. Sinful wrath always destroys and tears down. And we see that when we, if somebody offends us or upsets us or whatever, we lash out and it's chaos and destruction and whatever. But righteous wrath isn't like that. It moved Paul to do something constructive. It galvanized him to action. And that action was to proclaim God and his son who reveals him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I want to do something about this. I'm not just going to get angry about it. I'm not just going to complain about it. I'm not just going to cry about it. I'm going to do what I can in God's uh, power to change this, to make it as it should be. And so he resolved, it's clear from here, isn't it, that while he waited for Silas and Timothy to join him in Athens, he would preach Christ to the people. And so we find him in verse 17. And notice the link word here. We've got verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. Right, verse 17, first word here, so, therefore, because he saw all this and he was so upset about it, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. And then later on in this chapter on Mars Hill with the philosophers. So what does Paul do? He sees these people rejecting, despising the living God. Not necessarily consciously, perhaps, but they're not worshipping him. They're not loving him. They're not following him. They're not standing in awe of him. And he sees them running after others and giving what they've been created to give to God to others. And Paul says, right, I'm going after these people then. And I'm going to tell them about God. And I'm going to point out what they're doing. And I'm going to present this awesome, glorious God to them. And the challenge that he um, lays down for them. And so Paul goes whenever he can find people. He says, right, I want to proclaim this God to the Jews and Jesus Christ to the Jews. And so he goes into the synagogue and the devout persons, the, the Gentiles who were attracted by Judaism, he finds them there. And then he goes into the marketplace with other people. And then he goes to the philosophers. Basically, Paul says, I'm taking this God and this message about him and this message that reveals his glory and his majesty to the people. Because Paul knew there's no point just getting worked up about the fact that people are not glorifying God. I must change that situation as God enables me. And how is that going to change? By these people getting to know about this God. And then once they've got to know about him, getting to know him for themselves. And how is that going to happen? Well, Paul would say in Romans, wouldn't he? How are they going to hear without a preacher? And so Paul goes out and declares the message. And I love it in verse uh, 23. He sums up his work, really, doesn't he? He says, What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim 
to you. They're conscious there's something more, but they don't know him. So Paul says, well, let me take the darkness away. Let me enlighten, enlighten you. The God. <laughs> Who made, and then off we go with God. And he reveals to him, doesn't he, God's power. Uh, and God's creative power, his sovereignty, that he's the one who created and pointed and put people here, there, and everywhere. And then, of course, there's a challenge. And this God you have offended, and this God is going to judge this world. This God is going to judge you one day by his son, Jesus Christ. And so it's vital that you repent. You see, Paul says, I want people to glorify God. How is that going to happen? By them knowing this God. And how are they going to know this God? By hearing about this God. And how are they going to hear about this God? Through me. And so Paul's whole ministry in Athens and everywhere, really, was energized by this passion to see God glorified. And so I ask myself, uh, and I ask you, tonight are you passionate about the glory of God does it distress us that God is set aside in this place does it hurt do our hearts ache to see God respected cherished and valued do we want to see God enthroned in people's lives? People are turning from idols to serve the true and living God. Do we feel that? And if we feel that, what are we going to do about that? Are we just going to bemoan it in prayer? Because I've heard some prayer meetings that are all about bemoaning the state of things. And then going home and doing nothing about it. Bemoaning it. Or, or of course, it wasn't like this 30, 40 years ago, of course. Oh, we should have heard Kliddach in those days resounding. Well, not back 100 years, perhaps. Resounding with the praises of God. Oh, terrible, wonderful those days. Terrible today. Or are we going to do something about it? Because the only way that will change is by people coming to know God. And God's made it clear that that happens as we pray for that and as we work for it in proclamation. And I wonder, what does, if we are doing, if we, you are engaged, I know, in outreach and evangelism, what is energizing that? Is it simply because, well, that's what gospel churches are supposed to do? That's how we justify our existence, really. Or because you've heard sermons on it, so I suppose we better do it because we've been told that's what we've got to do from a sermon. Or is it because It would make life a bit easier for you and more enjoyable. You know, wouldn't it? It, it would be lovely if there were so many more people in Clidach who came to know the Lord. And they came here and it would be lovely. Can you imagine the atmosphere on a Sunday? This place full and people worshipping and you're, how on earth are we going to do it? We'll have to have people meeting downstairs and relay it and all because we've got so many people coming. That would be lovely and exciting, wouldn't it? Is that your vision? can be so subtle, can't it, that we have the wrong vision. The vision is, I just want to be in a church which feels like it's going somewhere and it's feeling good and, oh, it's lovely and it's exciting to go there on a Sunday and that's what it's all about. I just want to fill this church. And again, you hear people pray about that. Lord, my prayer is that this church would be full because that would be nice and lovely and exciting and make me feel good. Is that what's driving the evangelism? Is the only reason we reach out for Christ because we want people to be saved from hell. Now, that's a vital thing, isn't it? That should be at the heart. We should have a concern and a care for souls. And we should be grieved at the thought that they are going to hell without Christ. But what about this bigger picture, ultimately, of the glory of God? I want people to know Christ. Yes, so the church will feel like it's going somewhere. Yes, so that... Um, People would be saved from hell, but also so that Christ would be honoured and magnified in this area. Bruce Millen says this as we come to a close. There can be no deeper or purer motivation for mission than this. A heart yearning that the idols in human hearts be dethroned by the gospel. And the one true and living God be hearts he has created, sorry, one true and living God, be enthroned in hearts he has created for his praise. 
uh, the Moravians uh, were a great world mission movement. Do you know what their motto was? What are you doing this for? What's the raison d'etre of this movement? They said this, to win for the lamb the reward of his sufferings. It's all about winning glory and honour for Jesus Christ. He died for this, for the glory that was set before him. He endured the cross and despised the shame. And it says we are all about ensuring that he has that glory. To win for the Lamb the reward of his sufferings. And is that your motto? I don't know if you have mottos uh, in the church. Uh, I remember when I was in school, we, had the, we didn't have a motto and then the inspectors were coming, and about a fortnight before, a motto went up on the wall, and we all had to recite it, and then we never heard it again, but once the inspectors had gone. But if you, nothing wrong with a motto if, you, if it means something, and you, you really follow it. To win for the Lamb the reward of his sufferings. What do we see? How do we feel? And what do we do about that?